Um, we're delighted today um, to be hosting Associate Professor Mark Kelly, who's uh, visiting us from uh, the University of Western Sydney, or no, Western Sydney University now. It's a right? very important yes, distinction. Yes, I know, sorry. Yeah. Um, and he's part of the broader School of Humanities and Communication Arts, but you're in the philosophy program. Yes. And um, he's also worked as an ARC Future Fellow on the topic of um, sort of thinking about the genealogy of norms and normativity. And his expertise is Vico, which he'll be talking to today. He's also worked at Middlesex, Monash and Macquarie Unis. Um, so please make Mark very welcome and um, with no further ado. Thanks, Rosie. Okay, so what I'm going to be talking to today, it's, I mean, really, what I'm going to say is based on an essay I've got forthcoming. It's already written. It's going to come out in the journal Telos, which is an American philosophy journal, probably next year because of the backlog of submissions they have. In the meantime, I'm thinking about it and trying to change it uh, and so on. So, you know, feedback is, is very welcome. If anyone, you want to do any free affective labor and help me out here. So I'm going to butcher this and try and kind of give you some insights that will fit into the time frame that we have. The key idea, and I'm going to go on to talk about this in detail in a minute, is applying a notion from Foucault that people don't often talk about very much, but I'm very keen on. It's quite a marginal notion in Foucault's work. This notion is the notion of the tactical polyvalence of discourse. Uh, try and avoid reading the giant chunk of text yet, or we'll lose focus on what I'm saying, but the, the phrase tactical polyvalence. I mean, is, that, is that even legible to you, just about? Um, yeah, there's a big chunk of text I've got up there, which is where Foucault actually explains I take it what this phrase, the tactical polyvalence of discourses, means. I mean, this isn't a concept that Foucault uses a whole bunch. And I take it that's probably because it's such an unwieldy phrase. It's a pr pretty kind of ugly one. But I think it's, it's really, really important. It's really important at getting at the kind of nexus that Foucault talks about with the phrase he uses more often, the kind of power knowledge. Well, the question here really is how, I mean, put it in the most basic way, words and politics relate to one another. And I think that, I mean, this is, it's not just a point that pertains to this one concept, okay? So I'm a, I'm a Foucault scholar and I've been working on Foucault primarily, really, for, you know, most of my adult life at this point, 15 years or so. And it, it seems to me that despite the fact that Foucault's name, and I think this is true today as it was 10 or 20 years ago, is everywhere, and Foucault, references to Foucault are completely ubiquitous. There was a study about 10 years ago that showed that Foucault is the most widely cited figure in the humanities and social sciences. I mean, more than you know, anyone else you can name, more than Marx or Freud or any of these big names. Foucault's Discipline and Punish, I believe, although I haven't seen a study to this effect, but I believe is the most academically cited single work that's ever been written. So references to Foucault are very ubiquitous, but I think as a, a Foucault scholar that generally people haven't really understood what Foucault's getting at, that we're still living in a kind of sub-Foucaultian period where people haven't really absorbed the lessons. And I'm going to talk about this today in relation to the way that, that people approach language in relation to politics. And I'm going to talk about what I take it a prevalent approaches, uh, not so much in academia, but in society at large in the West to the way language and politics are supposed to relate to one another. Now, just to give some background here, I'm going to take it that I was invited here based on some work I've done uh, on Foucault and imperialism, um, global politics, and one aspect of that is to talk about how racism operates in the world today and to talk about you know, what, I, what I take it, we could say loosely, is structural racism. This is what we find if we use Foucault's analysis of power relations to look at the way our society works, we find uh, racism at a structural level. I mean, Foucault doesn't really like this word structure, but I, you know, 
his, his reasons for not liking it are very pedantic and, and I'm not too right about them. Now, what I want to talk about today is the kind of negative corollary of that, which is to talk about inter alia forms of anti-racism today, which I think go about anti-racism in, in, let's say, the wrong way. That I, I think that the prevalent way of approaching racism in our society is to focus on what I, what I think, and here I may get into trouble, but you know, that's, that's all to the good. We'll see what comes up in the questions. But to focus on what I think are relatively superficial kind of surface effect dimensions of racism without attending to the structures. I mean, this relates to this idea that I have about the relationship between discourse or language, which really is more or less the same thing, or a discourse is a concrete instance of language, that people focus on racism at a linguistic level rather than what we could call a structural level. And this isn't just the case of racism, it's the case of you know, all the uh, big name major social prejudices, uh, homophobia, transphobia, sexism, I take it are the, the most prevalent, but of course there's, there's many more we could talk about them and I might mention them. Now what I've said in, in work I've done before that people here, some people may have read, is that racism is, is tied particularly to, to imperialism. And I take it that that is precisely a dimension that tends to disappear when you start focusing on the linguistic dimension, uh, that, that that kind of global political dimension uh, tends to vanish. Okay, that's just an aside about how those of you who have read some of my other stuff might relate where I am now because it, it might seem quite different to where I have been before. But this is to kind of really uh, you know, have, a, have a go effectively at uh, other ways of conceiving racism that I think are unhelpful or have political problems. Okay, I'll get now into the conceptual underpinnings of what I'm going to say. And the, the conceptual underpinning really is this, this very long quote. I, I'm going to just read it out. You can all read along with me. I apologize for the wordiness, but uh, I feel like it's, it's unavoidable. But hopefully once you've absorbed this a little bit, it'll be clear, clearer what's going on. So, so what Foucault says in The History of Sexuality, Volume 1, and this is, I think, you know, like many things that Foucault does in The History of Sexuality, Volume 1, I think this is a kind of incredibly important insight that's um, just that he just kind of throws in there as an aside in the midst of doing all this other stuff uh, that's easily missed. So Foucault says, we must conceive discourse as a series of discontinuous segments whose tactical function is neither uniform nor stable. To be more precise, we must not imagine a world of discourse divided between accepted discourse and excluded discourse, between the dominant discourse and the dominated one, and but as a well, I know I've done with the word discursive there, but there's a multiplicity of discursive elements that can come into play in various strategies. It is this distribution that we must reconstruct with the things said and those concealed, the enunciations required and those forbidden that it comprises. With the variance and different effects, according to who is speaking, his position of power, the institutional context in which he happens to be situated, that it implies, and with the shifts and reutilizations of identical formulas for contrary objectives, that it also includes. Discourses are not, once and for all, subservient to power or raised up against it any more than silences are. I want to focus on that sentence in particular. We must make allowance for the complex and unstable process whereby discourse can both be an instrument and an effect of power, but also a hindrance, a stumbling block, a point of resistance, and a starting point for an opposing strategy. Discourse transmits and produces power. It reinforces it, but also undermines and exposes it, renders it fragile and makes it possible to thwart it. In like manner, silence and secrecy are a shelter for power, anchoring its prohibitions, but they also loosen its holds and provide for relatively obscure areas Tolerance. Okay, there's a lot there. But if I can kind of condense this to, to two claims. Firstly, I mean, drawing attention to that, that one sentence, discourse to not once and for all subservient to power or raised up against it, any more than sciences are. I mean, the, the claim here basically is any given discourse, and we can you know, talk not just about discourse, but individual phrases or words. By Foucault's point of view, don't have a permanent political meaning. And this, I think, is 
something that really goes against the prevalent way language is interpreted in relation to politics today. That is, I take it that the standard way of looking at language and politics today is to look at language to say, here is a form of language that is, to use the parlance of our times, problematic, as if that is a quality of the language itself, that there are bad words and bad discourses, and that that can be determined through various means. I mean, there, there are many different ways that is determined. Uh, one of the, the worst in terms of being the least safe ways of determining what language might be good or bad is to look at its origins. That is to say, uh, here we have a word or a phrase that historically has had this role, therefore it must have that political valence in general. So from Foucault's point of view, you basically can't say this in the sense that you can't rule out that discourses, words, phrases that historically have had you know, political valences, political alliances that you don't like, you can't rule out that they may go on to be progressive in the future. And the contrary is also true. The fact that you know, a word, a discourse has historically been politically progressive does not mean that it can't be harnessed by totally contrary political tendencies in the future. And it's also worth noting, this is also true for Foucault, not just of discourses, but of silence itself. Right? Not saying things uh, also can have many different political valences. That is, saying nothing can have a political function, and its political function can be, let's say, very loosely, Foucault wouldn't use his terms, but good or bad. Okay, Foucault, in his work, gives us, I think, three clear concrete examples of what he means here, which hopefully will make this a bit clearer. Uh, it helps if you know Foucault a bit, but I'll explain it. So the earliest one I think you can find in Foucault's work is in Discipline and Punish, where he talks about the prison, and specifically the discourse of prison reform. The tactical polyvalence of prison reform discourse for Foucault is that when people want to reform the prison, obviously the idea there is that they're trying to change the situation and improve it. Foucault thinks that this discourse, however, ultimately just ends up being a constitutive part of what he calls the carceral system, the prison system. Because, as Foucault points out, from the very moment the prison existed in the form that it does as an institution today, which is basically the end of the 18th century, you have the discourse of prison reform going, ah yes, there's lots of problems with the prisons, but if only we reform them, they'll work better. It, the prison reform existence came into existence at the same time as prisons came into existence and has constantly accompanied them. And for Foucault, that is part of the way that the prison system can continue to exist, despite the fact that we know that there are all kinds of problems with mass incarceration, and particularly the, the one that Foucault, I think, makes the main point, I would say, of Discipline and Punish, which is that prisons produce recidivism, prisons produce crime. We know that this is the case. It's always been the case with the prison. Despite the fact we know that, because you can cling to the idea that we, we might reform the prison and then the prison will no longer produce crime, we can continue imprisoning people in large numbers on the basis that, yes, if we just do a few things differently, suddenly it's all going to start working. Second example, and these examples are all quite different, and that's, that's part of the point I'm trying to make here. What Foucault talks about in society must be defended, what he calls the discourses of race struggle. What Foucault's claim in society must be defended is that the discourses of both right and left in the modern world, so both what we might call racism in the ordinary sense, the idea that literally there are different races of people which are biologically different and are locked in a struggle with each other, and the left-wing discourse of a struggle between different social classes, ultimately these two discourses are based in the same trope. Now, there are certain French philosophers who have taken from this fact the idea that somehow all left-wing thought is anti-Semitic or something like that. This isn't Foucault's point, although Foucault doesn't shy away from pointing out that uh, socialist movements in France do have and elsewhere have a deep history of anti-Semitism and, and racism in an ordinary sense. The point here for Foucault is the idea that society is composed of mutually opposed groups can either be taken up in a left-wing direction, that's the discourse of class struggle, or in a right-wing direction uh, with racist ideas. Lastly, there's Foucault's analysis in the history of sexuality of the way 
the phrase homosexuality has been used. Specifically, homosexuality as a word was invented in the 19th century by psychiatrists as a diagnosis of a mental illness. The idea was homosexuality was a particular categorization of people who had a particular mental illness. Now, obviously that's not what we primarily mean by homosexuality today, and that is precisely Foucault's point, that homosexuality have originally been invented as a badge of sickness is then reappropriated by homosexuals as a self-description. Now, Foucault already thought in the 1970s that there was, I mean, and this is Foucault speaking as a homosexual, uh, that homosexuality was beginning to become kind of conservative in the sense of uh, the liberatory function being exhausted and it's starting to just attach people to a defined identity. The point I'm trying to make overall with these is that there's really completely different patterns here. It's not the case, um, so it's not the case that, um, you know, tactical polyvalence always has to mean that you have a term that's invented one way and is reappropriated. Uh, the, the point is that, effectively, I think, you cannot look at these discourses in their inherent contents. You can't analyze the words and then from that get the political function. Foucault's idea is that the only way you understand the political functioning of any word discourse is by precisely looking at how it functions politically. But that means you have to keep looking at it if you want to understand how it's changed over time there's no guarantee that it will continue to function the same way. Indeed, there's no guarantee, therefore, that although Foucault thinks that prison reform discourse has always had this kind of essentially conservative function, that it will continue always to do that. Uh, one needs to be aware of the context and what's changing. This is really the last bit of Foucault I'm going to give you, and it's, it's much shorter than the previous one. So, uh, two dicta, that is, sayings from Foucault. So, the first one, really, really great, li great line from Foucault. I think it's, it's very applicable. Uh, everything is dangerous. Now, I think this is important uh, to remember in the situation of language and politics, because it's simultaneously the case that I mean, any use of language in relation to politics is potentially dangerous. It carries with it its dangers, precisely because of this question of tactical polyvalence. That is, it's ambiguous in advance what affects any words you say. I mean, here we can make a very general point, which I'll make in a, in a second. I mean, see how general this claim is. It's not every use of language is dangerous, just everything is dangerous. Any time you say anything, and certainly what I'm saying now is no exception, and I'll possibly get on to explore that towards the end, any time you say anything, you're, out, you're no longer in control of the effects it has. And here I'll get on to the longer point. Um, I know people have difficulty with this quote. It has a lot of very basic words, but like, it can be a bit difficult to pass. So people know what they do, Okay, take it the first bit's pretty clear. People know what they do. We know, we, everyone knows, like I, I got up this morning, I know what I do, right? They frequently know why they do what they do. I guess I knew I had to get up this morning, like to get coffee probably. So, first two are pretty obvious. What they, and this, this bit's the hard bit. What they don't know is what what they do does, right? I mean, that's a kind of slightly awkward phrasing. The idea is we don't know what the effects of our actions are. And again, this is a completely general statement in Foucault. I mean, actually, I should be honest that this, this is a statement attributed to Foucault that uh, he allegedly said in a conversation. Uh, I think this really encapsulates a lot of what Foucault is getting at, uh, so I like to think that he did say it, but um, that's not 100% confirmed. The idea here is we don't know what the effects of our actions are. And I take it, you know, regardless of whether Foucault said it or not, this is a profoundly true fact about the way that actions work. I mean, Foucault defines power as actions upon the actions of other people. And essentially, Foucault's notion of power uh, is that when we act, it affects other people, and that produces a network of effects. That's what Foucault thinks power is, the way our actions influence other people's actions. 
But we simply don't know. We can have some idea, certainly, and indeed Foucault's analyses are supposed to give us a better idea. We have some clue about the way our actions might affect other people. But, you know, I'm going to say something, there's, you know, whatever, 50 people in here. Different people will take things I say different ways. There will be misunderstandings, correct understandings. Uh, it will interact with other things you've heard from other people, your background beliefs. I have no way of accurately predicting what impact my words will have. And I think that's true of you know, pretty much anything other than the, the most basic actions we can have. And not just at that first level, but then we're talking about, if we're going to talk about politics, we have to talk about the recursive effects. Like if I say something, you're going to hear something, maybe it will cause you to act in a different way which will affect other people, have a kind of ripple effect throughout the social field, but in a profoundly ambiguous way. And I think this is something that, th this point is something that's completely missing from the contemporary understanding or approaches to the relationship between language and politics. That is, it's typically imagined that we know that certain words, discourses have certain political effects, that um, they make people feel a certain way, that they encourage certain forms of action. And I think basically these claims are really dubious. It's not known. In a, it's not knowable in advance what using certain forms of words will do. A lot of this stuff really uh, is kind of, let's say, phantasmic. It's imagined. People imagine the way they think other people will respond to things and develop an attitude to language based on those imaginings. But that, I think, is uh, going back to everything is dangerous, in itself potentially a dangerous form of thinking about the relationship between language and politics. So I'm really going to get to the kind of meat of things here. Now, the way of thinking about the relationship between language and politics that I'm criticising, I think can be neatly summarised by this concept of representation. This is a little bit fraught talking about representation because representation has a lot of different meanings, like it's been used in a lot of different ways, including by Foucault himself. And in fact, what I'm saying has nothing to do with anything Foucault has to say about representation. The meaning of the term representation, though, I'm thinking about is the one that is popularly invoked in the slogans, representation matters and representation is everything. Uh, these are, I mean, I've actually <laughs> written down the popularity of these phrases on Google somewhere. Yeah, so the phrase, the exact form of words, uh, representation matters. Now, th that precise form Google's 400,000 results. Uh, and I, I note here that it uh, has completely eclipsed the popularity of the old feminist slogan, the personal is political. And the phrase, re representation is everything, which is an even greater claim for the value of political representation, Google's 90,000 hits. And if you, you know, want to Google those, I mean, I'm not encouraging you to do it right now, but, you know, I guess you could. Uh, you know, the, the, the top hits, you'll obviously get, um, you know, kind of BuzzFeed listicles, but you'll also get, you know, prestige like New York Times articles and so on, arguing for the importance of representation. Now, I take it representation relates to language in the old way, of conceiving of language as supposing to you know, represent a state of affairs. But by talking about representation, I'm trying to broaden things away from just thinking about language, but thinking about what we might call, although again, this is a word that's used in lots of different ways, but what we might call symbolization more generally. So, I take it the idea here is that, well, I mean, there's a lot of different ideas here. Actually, the, I've realized the first thing I want to say is actually the last of five points I'm going to put up. So I'm now going to just like zoom straight through them so I can grab onto like, oh no, it was that one. This, ignore that stuff. This, this phrase, reverse mimesis, 
I think, uh, I mean, this is an awkward phrase I've invented, but I think it, it captures the idea that I think the language of representation is supposed to get at. And I'll get on some concrete examples in a minute. I'm steering clear of them for the minute. So the idea of reverse mimesis, I, I think there's an idea that, um, I mean, this is an implicit idea. I don't see people really claiming this directly. But there's an implicit idea that society comes to resemble the way it represents itself to itself. I mean, look, I'll, I'll get a bit more concrete. The thing I'm really thinking of here, there's lots and lots of different instances at different levels that I think this occurs, is the discourse around representation in media, uh, particularly in kind of film and television of, let's say, marginalized groups, subaltern groups. And this has become a really elevated political terrain of struggle, I think, in the last few years. That is, that, uh, I mean, certainly if you spend as much time on Twitter as I do, this seems to be, if anything, the most, you know, the thing people spend the most time arguing about is uh, representation in the media of particular groups. And I take it the idea here is that somehow by modifying the way groups are represented in the media that this will have wide-ranging social effects by which society will change to resemble what's being presented to it. Now, that's not the only logic of this. I mean, I take it that this idea that representation is important starts in an unarguably kind of correct place. I mean, it, it starts, I take it, with a kind of, an, across a, a broad range of areas, a fight against the exclusion of particular groups from representation in the first place. That is, clearly, we have a background here where not so long ago, if you weren't white, cis male, heterosexual, you were invisible, you weren't represented in positions of power or in the media, or if you were represented, you were represented in a negative way, let's say, in the media representation. So there's a struggle which I in no way want to question to try to get rid of the subjective damage done to people by forms of misrepresentation. The problem is not so much for me that I mean, there's no problem with, with that basic insight. The problem is the uh, kind of quantity of hope that's put into the idea that by altering representation, we will thereby affect some large-scale social change. Essentially, what I'm going to argue is that a kind of anti-racism or you know, struggle for equality in other areas focused on representation because it fails to under, it attend to uh, you know, structural inequalities in society, uh, will ultimately have very ambiguous effects. And it's at this point that I want to claim that what's true of the tactical polyvalence of discourse is uh, by that token true of representation, that we do not know what the political effects of changing representation will be. We can't read off, for example, the fact that historically having overrepresentation of white heterosexual cis males, that by getting rid of that will actually make a political or social difference. So there's a series of kind of concerns I have here or, or kind of possible effects which uh, I think we can at least suspect may happen, which caused me to be dubious about the focus on representation. So one is, is straight from Adorno's uh, culture industry essay in the Dialectic of Enlightenment. Uh, I mean, the, the specific example that Adorno gives is of a young woman who goes to the cinema and sees a heroine in a film with which she identifies herself. I mean, this, this would be a kind of classic case of precisely at this level, the effect that partisans of representation talk about, that the idea that uh, having someone you can identify with uh, 
in media representation is a positive good that uh, will help you, will elevate you, will be a subjective good, or will cancel out the subjective bad from the lack of representation you previously saw. Now, Adorno's reading of this is that, and I've used his psychomotic term, sublimation and catharsis, although Adorno actually doesn't hear, that, but this describes what he thinks happens, namely that, you know, a woman who is essentially disempowered in her own, own life, I mean, I take it that what the prevalent representation discourse imagines is if they go and see a powerful woman on screen, they will be empowered and this may cause that woman to um, break the cognitive shackles imposed by patriarchal society or something like that. Adorno's idea is that by seeing a powerful woman on screen, they actually feel sublimation of their desires. That is, okay, someone else has already done this. I feel kind of satisfied vicariously by seeing them do some powerful things on screen. And I'm actually less likely to go out and do anything for myself. Uh, catharsis, similarly, if you have pent up resentment against the you know, patriarchal conditions in which you live, having seen uh, someone defying those conventions on screen, you may feel, well, okay, like I'm relieved of some of the pressure of resentment that I have. My point is not at all that that is always what happens, but that this is just as possible, let's say, at least prima facie, uh, as someone being empowered in the sense of going on to actually uh, do something as a result of seeing a particular form of representation of the group to which one belongs. Indeed, this very notion of empowerment, and this is true of much of the discourse of representation, I think has this problem precisely that it focuses on what we could call, and I think what I'd, I'd like to call the subjective dimension of uh, people's position, that is, Representation is lauded because it, precisely because it phenomenologically makes people feel better about themselves. However, I take it the kind of Adornoian point is feeling better about yourself uh, does not automatically translate into any form of political action and indeed may transform into political inaction. There's a study I saw. Uh, well, I reference in, in the paper about the impact of increasing, this is a different form of representation, but still a form of representation, the increasing representation of women in parliaments around the world. Now, it's absolutely the case that that form of representation, so women's political representation, is clearly a kind of more substantive form of representation than merely uh, women, there being more women or more powerful women in roles in the media. But it's understood in the same logic, namely that um, seeing women in powerful positions will inspire people to act. For, I mean, something worth saying both about the media and uh, the situation of, say, parliaments or you know, boards of directors of companies, that promoting individuals from marginalised groups in those situations is clearly a kind of localised gain for those people. So there's no question at all that for female actors, uh, increasing women's representation in the media is actually an, an immediate good for them. The logic of representation, though I take it, is focused not on the immediate good for the people involved, but the fact that those people are representatives of a larger group and that their elevation may help women more broadly, which is what I'm dubious of, not the idea that there's a direct benefit to media workers, which there clearly is. The study I was about to reference about women's parliamentary representation is that what, what this study showed is precisely that women were much more likely to feel politically engaged. So as the number of women in parliaments increases, uh, women in the general population will report feeling that they are included in the political process at much higher levels. What doesn't increase is women's political participation. In fact, there's some evidence, or this is much lower, that it drops. That is, women are less likely to vote, admittedly marginally. Uh, there's but certainly no more likely to vote when female representation in parliaments increases, which is counterintuitive, but indicates precisely, I think, uh, 
that there's a possible effect in this direction, namely that increasing women's representation in parliaments make women feel like, okay, things are, things are going well, uh, and consequently um, actually become more politically disengaged. This is the danger, I think, of representation, precisely because it's not focused on politics itself, but rather the kind of symbolic level. Okay, this is a slightly more convoluted point I want to make, uh, depending on recognition theory. I don't know how much familiarity you have with that. Um, there's a, a lot of work these days in philosophy, social philosophy, about the concept of recognition, which ultimately comes from Hegel's work, but is most associated today with the fourth generation of the Frankfurt School. Fourth, third, third generation. Yes, third. I'm getting ahead of myself. Third generation of the Frankfurt School, particularly Axel Honneth. Uh, the idea here is that recognition is in itself a social group, that it, a social good. That is, to feel one is recognized by one's community is, I mean, and actually for someone like Connett, it's the single social good. Like the most important political thing is for people to be recognized. I don't disagree with that particularly. I certainly think it's extremely important. What I don't think, however, is that representation in the media, let's focus on that example for now, but I think this is true across the board. I don't think representation in the media is really capable of giving people recognition. And this is because I think representation is always misrepresentation. Now what I mean by that is that, and here I'm paraphrasing a saying of Foucault's that knowledge is always misknowledge. I mean, that makes more sense in French than it does in English. But the idea here is that, I mean, the idea of that knowledge is misknowledge is the idea, if you think you understand something in the world, you're basically wrong. Uh, every, every attempt to understand the world fails to get some nuance of it correct because uh, our ability to understand the world is not perfect. I take it this is basically true of representation in the sense that uh, if representation were to aim at accuracy, which incidentally it, it doesn't because it can't, but if I try to accurately represent the lived experience of a particular group on screen, while well, I certainly may accurately represent some aspect of their experience, there inevitably will be dimensions of their experience that doesn't come across. Now, that's not like to have a platonic argument that all art is bad and should be banned because it fails to accurately capture reality. The point here is that it's not about accurately capturing reality. And that's fine. Right? The media is not trying to be 100% accurate, and if it were, that would be a terrible idea because that kind of naturalism can't work. But what that means is that you cannot, as a real concrete individual, feel adequate forms of recognition from identifying with someone on the screen. Because someone who you identify on the screen is always a kind of false image that doesn't actually encapsulate what it's like to be a real person. So if that's what you're trying to get, that is recognition, from representation, my argument is you can't reach it. Now this goes back to something that was in the initial Foucault quote, namely the idea of silence being a potential shelter for power. This is a concern I have about representation too, namely that it is possible to alter the representation in the media and indeed in positions of authority, company boards, parliaments, and so on, without changing the demographics of those who really hold power in the society. I mean, the really here has to be a little bit in scare quotes, but a really important thing to note here is that uh, there's a lot of talk in representational discourse about changing who are on the boards of directors of companies, who, who are the CFOs and CEOs of companies. I haven't, I don't think, seen any talk about changing who the shareholders or owners of companies are. And I take it that those are the groups who hold the greatest power. Indeed, I take it that regardless of, you know, what group you come from, whether you're, you know, what sex you are, what race you are, if you're the CEO of a company, you're essentially still a functionary who has, is, is bound to do the same things. There's very little real freedom of operation. That's not true of people who are capitalists, uh, let's be 
bald about it, that is, the people who are billionaires uh, can do whatever they want with their money. And that includes, particularly in America now, uh, supporting whatever political tendency they want. They're not constrained at all. And there's, I mean, this is a, a lacuna that I think kind of makes a mockery of the, the whole thing. In any case, my argument here is that it's entirely possible that what uh, we're seeing with the shift of representation is um, a kind of brownwashing exercise that will change the apparent authority structure, uh, will you know, present us, when we turn on television, we'll have a vision of a society that is completely multicultural and where everyone is equal, uh, which completely conceals the real inequalities in our society from us. Um, and again, I say this is a, a concern about starting of representation first uh, rather than changing the structure of society first. I mean, these two don't have to be mutually exclusive. The, the, I mean, I, I should emphasize again, I probably can't emphasize this enough, that my claim here is not like we shouldn't, you know, I mean, my, my claim here is not to kind of go on a rant about like the gender swap ghostbusters and say, oh, it's like outrageous and we shouldn't have like women ruining our movies or something like this. The, the, the point here is, is not that I have any problem in itself with these representational measures. Um, like, I'm very happy to see them. The, the criticism here is of the idea that this is a real form of political action that's going to change society. Because, I mean, essentially we're changing the appearance of society, and that's a point I've already made, in the hope that by changing the image of society we give to ourselves, that actually will lead to a change of society itself. But I just don't think that's how society relates to culture. I mean, actually, a lot of this stuff, uh, this logic of representation, it, it occurs to me, I didn't put this in the original paper, but it's neatly captured by Andrew Breitbart's famous saying that politics is downstream of culture. I mean, this is a, a dictum effectively from the far right, the idea that we need to change the culture if we're going to change politics. Uh, I mean, a lot of the left seem to believe this as well. I don't believe this is true. I don't particularly think the opposite is true. I don't particularly think that politics drives culture. What I think, and this is the kind of Foucauldian point, is that culture and politics influence each other in very complex ways. Indeed, really, probably too complex to properly understand. But that does imply that you can't just kind of try to change what happens in the linguistic or cultural dimension and hope that that will have a recursive change to politics. And uh, here's a one word reason why, although I say a bit more than one word, reaction. Uh, Foucault has a great dictum that I almost put on that list of dicta before. He says, the mind is not made of soft wax, it reacts. I think there's a worrying tendency of people when they look at uh, representation in the media, etc., to imagine that audiences have minds made of soft wax that will simply be uh, changed by the representations they're seeing. This is not the case, and people are want to react to what they experience. That is, they'll go the other way. This at least will happen an appreciable amount of the time. It's entirely possible that by showing people a, a vision of a society uh, in which, let's say, um, you know, there's, there's, I mean, the, actually I've got a concrete image in mind, which is the film Black Panther, which I probably don't want to say too much about, but uh, maybe, maybe people ask about it they don't have a chance. But, I mean, the idea that, you know, seeing, um, you know, technologi technologically sophisticated society uh, in which, you know, black people autonomously are technologically uh, capable and sophisticated and intelligent, the rest of it. On the one hand, I think there's a danger of kind of misrecognition with this, this kind of thing, that this um, is so far from the direct lived experience of ordinary black people that they don't feel any re recognition through that because it has nothing to do with their lived experience. Uh, but it also, you know, d is potentially drives reaction. That is, um, people look at it and go, oh, this is terrible. Uh, of course, these people are racists, but that doesn't mean they don't have that reaction. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have a politically, uh, a political effect of reaction. There's also another worry that's related to this, which I haven't put down here, uh, namely one of repression. That is, that all you accomplish by changing the representations so that they no longer, um, you know, that they no longer show you know, white people as racially dominant, let's say, uh, 
is not that it just stops people being racist because they've seen, they can no longer see um, racist images on the screen. Uh, if one clamps down on that and prevents, and here we go outside of the discourse of representation into the kind of idea that you need to uh, clamp down on, on hate speech and so on um, to protect vulnerable groups. And one understands absolutely where that comes from. Uh, the danger, again, is there of reaction that this will actually provoke uh, more of the behavior that it was meant to suppress, but also that by, and here I'm just invoking a psychoanalytic concept of repression, that namely by forbidding the expression of certain sentiments, this doesn't make those sentiments go away, that there will always be a kind of return of the repressed. Uh, and this is precisely because focusing at things, on things at the level of language, and here I'm dealing with language more broadly than merely representation when I talk about this, which is why it's not on this list, but uh, we're talking about the repression of certain discourses, certain ways of talking. That doesn't get rid of the attitudes that underlay it, and it doesn't get rid of the social structures that underlie it, more importantly. And as long as those exist, I think we can realistically expect that it's going to kind of come back to bite us. Okay. I'm into my conclusion area now, which I think is, is right time-wise. Good. That's totally by accident, not by design, but that's good, it's worked out. Okay, so this is a something Foucault talks about. People often do notice that Foucault talks about this, although he actually only talks about it once, like in one place, I think. Subjugated knowledges. Um, Foucault's very keen to promote subjugated knowledges, right? That is, you know, things that people know out there which don't get a hearing because, I mean, of course, because those people have don't have the access to the media or to academia to put their perspectives across. It's extremely important uh, from Foucault's point of view, politically, to allow subjugated knowledges to be heard. The problem with the logic of representation is that it confuses subjugated knowledges with what I've called here subjugated categories of person. That is, the idea that certain people by membership of uh, a categorial group therefore have the subjugated knowledge. Uh, and I think that's, let's say, a problematic assumption. Like, it's, it's simply not the case that by being a member of a category of person, I automatically have the knowledge. I take it that the concern with subjugated knowledge, I put it here, uh, points towards a logic of democratization rather than representation. That is, that if we're concerned to hear subjugated knowledges, what needs to happen is for the space in which people speak to be opened up to hear a diversity of voices. And this is quite different to the logic of representation because it focuses the logic of representation precisely on representation in elite formations. So the logic of representation is um, most vociferously championed by uh, media workers in the media industry who I have to suspect uh, want to continue to be the gatekeepers for knowledge and certainly want to see more diversity in the media but don't want to see the power of the media eroded. Uh, and in relation to this logic, this question of democratization versus representation, I think it's worrying, because everything is dangerous, to see the extent to which uh, the established media organizations who are you know, notionally very in favor of representation and diversity, that they are very alarmed by the proliferation of what they label fake news on social media. Of course, that's a real thing, you know, the, the fake news websites that actually uh, broadcast fake news. But there, there seems to be a general concern uh, that the just proliferation of voices, uh, people connecting to one another in social media without media gatekeepers is a problem. And to my mind, that is more or less uh, exactly what actually needs to happen. Namely, that the internet has, although it's also allowed lots of, um, you know, people that we don't like, racists and so on to communicate with one another in the media uh, outside of the control of organisations who can gatekeep. Uh, this is still, I think, also the best chance for genuinely subjugated people to be empowered in a real way to uh, express themselves that we're seeing. Okay, I'm just going to focus on, at the end, I just want to quickly check my privilege, uh, which I, you know, like, I want to show that I'm, I'm not totally blind to the fact that I'm... And, you know, it's, it's a bad look, right? Like, I'm this, this um, white, cis, male, heterosexual 
standing up here and you know, criticizing these discourses which are aimed at diversity and so on, which is a bad look, uh, I'm going to admit it. Uh, one thing I would notice, a bit of a kind of um, two croquet fallacy, but that a lot of the partisans of the discourse of representation are themselves, I mean, certainly overwhelmingly white. Uh, maybe, you know, but there's certainly a lot of white heterosexual cis males in that space as well. Uh, particularly as the logic of representation has come to be a uh, kind of ideology which is embraced uh, not only by the left but also by kind of corporate uh, boardrooms and so on. It's clearly the case that I think that the discourse of representation is now being used as a kind of tool in the power struggles within the establishment within the elite. Uh, and from that point of view, I'm, it's true I'm aware that uh, what I'm saying, you know, is a bit impertinent uh, given that I'm in a privileged position, but I think uh, we shouldn't be blind to the privilege of a lot of people who are pushing that discourse in the first place. Uh, I also should want to recognise the polyvalence of my own speech, uh, namely that I'm aware that, and I did signal this a little bit earlier as well, that I'm aware that what I am saying is in itself polyvalent because everything is dangerous and everything is politically polyvalent from a Foucauldian point of view. I absolutely cannot guarantee in advance that publishing an article like this won't be immediately taken up and shared by internet racists. Uh, so, like, you know, I hope that won't happen. I assume it won't happen, otherwise I wouldn't have written it. But there's no guarantee in advance that one's going to find kind of the right audience. Now, my idea is that what I'm doing here is to offer a kind of tactical piece of advice to people on the left who want to engage in anti-racist struggle what, about what might be you know, more efficacious ways of going about things. So it's intended for that audience, and I take it appearing in a philosophy journal, it's unlikely to be you know, picked up by right-wing demagogues. Nevertheless, like, I mean, my, my whole point effectively is that when we say things, we throw them into the world, and I don't know what's going to happen to it, but you know, there it is, thank you.